To welcome us all sa ating 22nd Kapihang OH, ladies and gentlemen, our PCOM Quezon City Chapter President, Dr. Catherine Artais Cariaga. Maraming salamat, Dr. Margo. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat na aming tagapanood at tagapagsubaybay. Sa aming kapamilya sa PCOM, mga kapuso sa OSH, at kapatid sa profesyon ng kalusugan. Isang mainit na pagtanggap mula po sa amin dito sa PICOM Quezon City Chapter. Sa bansa, Pasko na ang simoy ng hangin. Ngunit ang pangamba dulot ng COVID-19 ay narito pa rin at patuloy na umaaligid sa ating mundong ginagalawan. Kamakailan lang ang hagupit ng bagyo lalo na si Bagyong Ulysses, ay nakadagdag sa pighati ng karamihan habang nakikipaglaban sa patuloy na pagdating ng unos at pagsubok dala ng pandemya. Lahat ng kinauukulan mula sa itaas at laylayan ng lipunan ay nakikipagtulungan upang maghanap ng lunas at maitawid ang pighati at agam-agam ng bawat isa lalo na ng ating mga mahal na manggagawang Pilipino. Ngayong gabi po, kami ay lubos na nalulugod dahil kasama po natin ang isa na namang eksperto sa larangan na ito. Sa ating ikadalawamput dalawang kapihang OH online na edisyon para talakayin ang DOH Department Memorandum 2020-0439 tungkol sa Omnibus Interim Guidelines on Prevention, Detection, Isolation, Treatment, and Reintegration Strategies for COVID-19. Huwag palang gabi sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat, Dr. Catherine Artais Cariaga. Ladies and gentlemen, my dearest colleagues, and to all our beloved guests from all sectors of workforce, We're very honored at napaunlakan tayo ng ating panauhing pandangal ngayong gabi. To introduce our distinguished and honorable guest tonight, may we call on our CME Chair, Dr. Maria Cecilia Deano. Thank you, Doc Margo. Dr. Maria Rosario Verhere is the current OIC Undersecretary for the Health Regulation Team and the official spokesperson of the Department of Health. She is the Public Health Services Team. She also acted as OIC Deputy Director General Field Regulatory Operation of the Food and Drug Administration and Office Director of the Health Services, uh, I'm sorry, Health Facilities and Services Regulatory Bureau and Chief of the Health Research Division of the Health Policy Development and Planning Bureau. Under Secretary Verhere has committed decades to public service, having worked in Marikina City's Health Office before joining the Department of Health in 2007. Aside from public service, She is also committed to nurturing our soon-to-be public health leaders serving as faculty at the Development Academy of the Philippines and part-time faculty in Ateneo School of Government. She obtained her undergraduate degree in zoology from the University of Santo Tomas, her medical degree from De La Salle University College of Medicine, and her Master of Public Health from the University of the Philippines, Manila. Ladies and gentlemen, I now give you our speaker, Yusek Maria Rosario Verhere. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, magandang gabi po sa lahat sa inyo. Uh, good evening to all the members of the Philippine College of Occupational Medicine. I just like to recognize the current president, Dr. Karyaga. Magandang gabi po sa inyo at salamat po sa pagkakaimbita sa Department of Health. Ito po sa inyong pagpupulong-pulong. As what uh, our uh, 
uh, our facilitator has mentioned, I will be discussing for tonight the omnibus interim guidelines of the Department of Health on prevention, detection, isolation, treatment, and reintegration strategies for COVID-19. The Department of Health continuously cal recalibrates its strategies targeted to mitigate COVID-19. And among its top priority is to increase the capacity of the health system to identify close contacts, suspects, and probable cases, and rationally refer them to appropriate healthcare facilities depending on the severity of their symptoms. DOH has employed strategies to strengthen contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine, as well as to scale up testing capacity of the country while exploring innovations and new technologies that can be useful in detecting the virus. Next slide, please. The succeeding slides will lay out our general principles that serve as the cornerstones of our COVID-19 response or the PDITR response, prevent, detect, isolate, treat, and reintegrate. Next slide, please. First, regardless of the severity of risk, the public shall strictly observe and implement in all settings the minimum public health standards, including physical distancing, hand hygiene, cough etiquette, and wearing of masks, among others. Second general principle is, when deciding on appropriate courses of action, isolation, quarantine, and testing decisions shall be based on proper clinical assessment anchored on two main factors. That would be symptoms and exposure. The pathway shall reflect the most cost-effective intervention following the pretest probability framework the quarantine to, uh, for us to decide if we are going to quarantine or isolate only, or to test plus to quarantine and isolate, or to test only. The third general principle is that all suspects, probable, and confirmed cases shall be isolated in the appropriate facility depending on the severity of symptoms. Asymptomatic and mild cases shall be isolated in temporary treatment and monitoring facilities. Moderate cases shall be isolated and managed in secondary care hospitals. And severe and critical cases shall be isolated and managed in tertiary care hospitals. Asymptomatic close contacts are advised to undergo home quarantine if conditions will allow. Next slide, please. Fourth general principle would be all close contacts of probable and confirmed cases shall be placed under and finish the 14-day quarantine, while the suspects, the probable, and the confirmed cases shall be placed under 10-day isolation regardless of test results. Fifth, when determining and using the right test for the right reason, the following shall be considered. First, the availability of the test. Second, the best time to use the test. Third, the turnaround time of the test result. And the last would be the specificity and the sensitivity of the test, which are independently validated. And the last general principle would be the RT-PCR remains to be the gold standard for diagnostic testing for COVID-19. Based on evolving evidence and RT-PCR capacity, the rapid antigen test may be used for diagnostic testing of suspects and probable cases in specific circumstances, particularly in areas with confirmed outbreaks and limited RT-PCR capacity. Next slide. So before we begin the pathways, let us briefly discuss the rationale for these pathways. Next slide, please. This slide will show the estimated time intervals of viral detection based on available evidence. The graph indicates that two days before the onset of symptoms or the presymptomatic phase, viral load is starting to increase and an infected individual can already be infected or can already infect others. Precisely why we trace and quarantine all close contacts of a probable or confirmed case even two days prior from the onset of symptoms. Also, for asymptomatic, since they will not develop symptoms, testing five to seven days after exposure approximates the time. This is the time of symptom onset. Hence, this is the best time to use and to test with RT-PCR. 
the incubation period for COVID-19 lasts up to 14 days. Hence, a person can always develop symptoms from 2 until 14 days after exposure. Next slide. Knowing the viral pathway based on available evidence, we updated our approach to emphasize quarantine and isolation. Since the incubation period of COVID-19 is 14 days, the quarantine period remains to be at 14 days. For isolation, several studies have already shown that among confirmed cases and symptomatic suspects and probable cases, they are less likely to transmit the virus 10 days after the onset of symptoms. Therefore, we have shortened the isolation period to just 10 days, provided that the symptoms of these patients had been resolved already for three consecutive days prior to their discharge. And for testing, the RT-PCR remains the gold standard in detecting the presence or absence of the virus. Next slide. Next, we would like to emphasize the importance of the exposure and the symptoms screening, especially when understanding the difference between quarantine and isolation. By definition, we isolate sick patients with a contagious disease to separate them from those who are not. This means those with symptoms, like the suspects and the probable cases, as well as those confirmed with the virus, should be isolated to reduce transmission of the virus and be provided with necessary medical attention and symptom management. They shall be managed in community isolation facilities or the TTMFs or hospitals with available medical professionals. On the other hand, quarantine refers to the separation and movement restrictions of people who were exposed to a contagious disease to see if they become sick. This means close contacts and those with history of travel from areas with local or community transmission should be quarantined to reduce potential transmission of the virus and be monitored if symptoms will develop or manifest. They shall be monitored in quarantine facilities, including hotels, repurposed schools, and other buildings to house these individuals for observation. Next slide. By clearly defining isolation and quarantine, we are able to first clearly identify and delineate the purpose of isolation facilities and quarantine facilities. Second, determine appropriate standards for certifying isolation facilities and quarantine facilities based on their intended purposes. And the third, to determine the appropriate reimbursement mechanisms from PhilHealth. Next slide. Aside from the symptoms and exposure, we must also appreciate the objectives for testing or the reasons why we test. This helps us to determine which testing technologies are appropriate depending on the objective, using the right test for the right reason as mentioned in our general principles. When testing to diagnose, we check for the presence of the COVID-19 virus in an individual. We do this among those with established history of exposure. In screening, we identify patients with COVID-19 before they manifest the symptoms. It aims to cut the transmission of the disease. And when doing testing for surveillance, we gather information on the prevalence of COVID-19 in a certain population. It may be done using random sampling of a certain percentage of a specific population so that we can monitor the trend in the prevalence, as well as to assess the effects of certain measures, such as the minimum public health standards. Hence, we test to diagnose close contacts, suspects, probable, and confirmed cases. Established exposure to a confirmed case plus high prevalence plus symptomatic. We test to screen returning Filipinos, returning residents, international and domestic travelers, and staycationers. And we test to do surveillance of essential health workers or essential workers in various companies. Next slide, please. Basically, there are three types of testing modalities available in uh, the Philippine market. The RT-PCR, the antigen, and the antibody. 
The RT-PCR or the real-time reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction is the most common type of test. It involves swabbing the nose and the throat. It looks for the genetic material, the DNA and the RNA of the virus, hence results have high accuracy. It is used as a confirmatory test for suspects, probable, and close contacts. The best time to subject a patient for PCR testing is at the onset of symptoms, that is for symptomatics, whereas for those without symptoms, it is after five to seven days after exposure. RT-PCR costs more compared to the other modalities of testing, and it requires a sophisticated laboratory setup, a biosafety laboratory level two, and which is, it is not easily available. It also requires skilled and trained staff to perform the test. RT-PCR testing is considered the gold standard for COVID-19 detection. Next slide, please. As to the antigen test, it tells you if you are infected with the virus now or if you are sick currently. It, in, it involves swabbing your nose and your throat as well. Antigen tests produce quicker results and they are cheaper than the RT-PCR. They do not require sophisticated laboratory equipments. However, they are less accurate than the RT-PCR test. They are only recommended for very specific situations such as when RT-PCR tests are unavailable and there are outbreaks. The DOH guideline states that when testing negative to antigen tests, a repeat test should still be done within 48 hours using antigen or RT-PCR. Next slide, please. And lastly, the antibody test or the serology test. It can only tell you if you have had the disease in the past and the results are not always accurate. It cannot be used to diagnose or to detect current infection. A positive test result does not mean that you cannot have the virus again. No evidence yet to tell or to state that you are protected. Usually, it is done through a finger or prick blood test. It is recommended by WHO only for research purposes. Next slide. Now that we have appreciated the rationale behind our COVID-19 response strategies, let us now proceed to the general case management of close contacts, suspects, probable, and confirmed cases. Just like all other strategies, contact tracing is an important component in containing outbreaks of infectious diseases. It involves the identification, the listing, the assessment, and the monitoring of persons who may have come into close contact with a confirmed or a probable COVID-19 case. This illustration shows how do we identify ourselves upon possible exposure to a confirmed case. Person A is a confirmed case who tested positive using RT-PCR. Person B is, a pers is person A's close contact, and we call them the first generation close con contact because she had any of the following exposures two days before and 14 days after the onset of symptoms of person A. The following would be considered a close contact if they have first face-to-face -face contact with a probable or confirmed case within one meter and for at least 15 minutes, direct physical contact with a probable or confirmed case, direct care for a patient with probable or confirmed COVID-19 disease without using the recommended PPE and other situations as indicated by local risk assessments. Now, person B may have had contact with other persons as well. In this case, they can be classified further under second and third generation close contacts. Person C is a second generation close contact of person A or a close contact of a first generation close contact of person B. Person B is now a third generation close contact of person A or a close contact of a second generation close contact, which is person C. On the other hand, person E is considered a general contact of person A or someone who may have been exposed to a confirmed case, such as those who were in the same event, social gathering, or venue as the confirmed case, but 
did not fulfill the case definition for a close contact, the ones that I have mentioned a while ago. As a general rule, close contacts of probable and confirmed cases shall be immediately placed under quarantine. In the event that they develop symptoms or test positive for COVID-19, they shall be immediately isolated, admitted, and treated in the appropriate facility depending on the severity of symptoms. While second, third generation and general contacts like persons C, D, and E are advised to self-monitor, to strictly adhere to minimum public health standards, and to report for the appearance of signs and symptoms. Next slide, please. For asymptomatic close contacts, immediate home quarantine is necessary. Testing among asymptomatic shall be done after five to seven days after exposure or if symptoms develop, whichever comes first. If they did not develop symptoms and the results turned negative, or they were not able to get tested, they still need to complete the 14-day quarantine period. If results turns to be positive, they need to be admitted to a temporary treatment and monitoring facility. Moreover, contact tracing shall commence immediately. They can be discharged from quarantine after completing a 10-day quarantine period from the date that they were swabbed. If the originally asymptomatic close contact developed symptoms, they shall be admitted to a TTMF and contact tracing shall start right away. Regardless of results, they shall complete the mandatory 10-day isolation from the date of onset of symptoms or the date when they were swabbed when former is not available. They can be discharged from isolation once the 10-day period is completed and has been asymptomatic for at least three days, whichever is longer. If the close contact is symptomatic during the contact tracing, they shall be admitted to the temporary treatment and monitoring facility immediately. They shall also be tested or swabbed immediately and contact tracing should begin even before waiting for the test results to come out. Regardless of the test results, they shall complete the mandatory 10-day isolation from the date of onset of symptoms or date swab when former is not available. They can be discharged from isolation once they completed the 10-day period inclusive of at least three days of being asymptomatic. It must be noted if there is a limited capacity for RT-PCR testing, antigen tests can be used for testing among those with symptoms, provided that the kits used pass the minimum sensitivity and specificity through independent validation. The local governments through the municipality or the city epidemiology and surveillance units shall be responsible in the reporting of the antigen results to the Department of Health. Next slide. For close contacts in the workplace, the same protocol shall be followed. They shall be quarantined or isolated in the company isolation rooms, assessed by the Occupation and Safety Health Officer for possible referral to higher facilities. For asymptomatic close contacts, the safety officer can coordinate with the respective Barangay Health Emergency Response Team of the patient for the transfer of the patient. For symptomatic close contacts, the safety officer shall coordinate with the temporary treatment and monitoring facility for the transfer of the patient. Again, the DOH would like to emphasize the importance of symptoms-based screening when returning to work. It is best not to allow a symptomatic worker to return to work and should advise the worker to seek medical att attention for proper management. Next slide. For those workplaces who intend to conduct surveillance testing for them to know the trend of the prevalence of COVID-19 or to evaluate whether their intervention on minimum public health standards are effective, they may opt to do pooled testing. Recently, the Health Technology Assessment Council has come up with their set of recommendations on pooled testing following a local study conducted by the Philippine Society of Pathology. Pull testing can be done for surveillance testing among asymptomatic patients in areas with low prevalence, that is 10% or less. 
the DOH together with the RITM will come up with a set of guidelines on pooled testing. Next slide. In settings with more than 10% prevalence, surveillance using pooled testing is no longer recommended as it is no longer cost efficient. The DOH cannot overemphasize that for the purpose of return to work, the DOH recommends that RT-PCR testing or any sort of testing shall not be done. We strongly advise that employees do strict symptom screening and strict observance of minimum public health standards. Next slide. So this will be my last slide. As we forge ahead towards new normal, we call on everyone to be the solution. It is, this is a significant behavioral change campaign that the DOH is implementing and disseminating to all of our kababayans. The virus will be here for a long time while we struggle to get a hold of the allocation for these vaccines. So in the meantime, each one of us can observe these minimum health requirements as part of our lifestyle. These are small acts of kindness that may have a big impact in preventing the spread of COVID-19. And based on studies, the implementation or the compliance to minimum health standards can reduce your chances of being infected by as much as 99%. So we call on your support to reinforce our efforts for this Be The Solution campaign in our communities. So let us continue to spread the word. Let us all help each other. Let us work as one, one government, one society. And uh, let us all be thankful uh, that uh, the COVID-19 cases are slowly decreasing. But we remind everybody not to be complacent. We should remain to be vigilant and cautious. And we should always remain to be safe. Thank you very much and over to you. Maraming salamat po, Yusik Verhere. It was a very insightful discussion po. Um, quick question lang po, ano po, Yusik, um, kasi po naging laganap na po ang, at, syempre unti-unti na po nagbubukas ang ating mga industriya. What are your thoughts regarding uh, testing of the antigen? Test kits na yung mga sa ano po, sa nga sa weddings, kung ano saan saan na po siya ginagawa at kung sino-sino po ang gumagawa na po eh. Ano pong masasabi niyo po doon? Yes, ma'am. Actually, the Department of Health uh, issued a guideline on antigen testing. Ang atin pong guideline ay base sa rekomendasyon galing sa World Health Organization at saka galing sa Health Technology Assessment Council ng ating uh, bansa. At dito sa guidelines na ito, uh, sinaad no, na ang antigen test ay maari lang gamitin sa mga taong may simptomas uh, in a clinical setting O di kaya pwedeng gamitin doon sa mga areas na may outbreak at walang access to RT-PCR. Pwedeng gamitin doon sa mga contacts, no? close contacts, ng no? mga nagkaroon ng COVID-19. At specifically, doon sa rekomendasyon ng WHO at saka HDAC, sinabi, you cannot use antigen for you to do screening. Hindi mo siya pwedeng gamitin as uh, uh, test uh, or method to do screening. Bakit ba ganun? Ang antigen test, it works uh, well and it is very accurate for those patients with symptoms, first five days. Kung matatandaan nyo yung NS1 antigen ng dengue, pag ginamit mo yon dahil magpapatest ka lang kasi may lagnat ang isang tao at gagamitin mo at magpopositibo siya because when you have fever, the viral load is high. Ganon din sa COVID-19. Doon sa unang limang araw ng iyong pagkakaroon ng simptomas with COVID-19, yan yung panahon na napakataas ng viral load mo. And the antigen test is very appropriate for you to use at this point. Pero doon sa mga tao na walang known exposure, walang simptomas, kapag ginamit mo ang antigen test, more likely you will produce false positive and false negative results. Yan po yung problema. Another problem would be, dadalawa, lang, dadalawa pa lang po ang isinasama ng WHO sa kanilang emergency use listing. Dalawang brand pa lang po ng antigen. Marami na pong nagkalat ngayon sa market ng mga antigen test, pero kailangan may validation either from the World Health Organization or from RITM, which is our National Reference Laboratory. Kasi nire-require po dyan sa validation, masisiguro mo na at least 80% sensitive yung antigen test mo at 97% specific. 
Marami sa mga antigen test ngayon na lumalabas ay hindi pumapasa dito sa 80% sensitivity. Meaning, we can be able to produce false negative results when we use antigen kapag po ganyan ang mga nagagamit natin na hindi po sukat sa mga standards ng WHO. Maraming salamat po. Isa pa kong quick question po. Paano po po ang process of return to work sa isang uh, worker po na lumabas na po ang kanyang resulta ng RT-PCR? Kukumplituhin pa po ba niya ang two weeks na quarantine? Negative naman po ang resulta. Kapag po ang isang tao ay tinest ng RT-PCR dahil siya ay close contact, kahit ano pa ang resulta ng kanyang test, kailangan niyang tapusin ang 14 days na quarantine. Ngunit kung siya ay tinest dahil sinescreen niyo lang siya para bumalik sa trabaho, kapag siya ay negatibo, pwede na siyang bumalik sa kanyang trabaho. Maraming salamat po. And last question po. No? Um, I know very busy po kayo, Yusek, at maraming salamat po sa inyong oras. Upon discharge po from isolation, can a worker be allowed to return to work immediately or meron po tayo mga dapat na test na gagawin po? Kapag ang isang tao ay na-isolate, uh, katulad po nang naipaliwanag ko kanina, ang isolation po, ina-isolate natin yung mga tao may simptomas o di kaya na-confirm na siya na positibo. So kapag na-isolate po siya, hindi po siya pwedeng palabasin ng isolation hanggang hindi siya makatapos ng sampung araw na pag-isolate at saka doon sa sampung araw na yon tatlong araw doon sa sampung araw, wala na siya dapat simptomas. At saka, clear siya ng kanyang doktor. Pag, naka, pag clearance na siya sa doktor, nakatapos siya nung 10 days, no symptoms at all, maari na po siyang bumalik sa kanyang trabaho. Ang sinasabi po ng ating mga eksperto, hindi lang po dito sa local, kung hindi internationally uli, also, and also being implemented in various uh, countries in the world, na kapag sampung araw na po kayo na positibo, no? from the time that you were swabbed or tested, that you pos tested positive, on the 10th day na wala ka ng symptoms for about 3 days already, hindi na ho kayo infectious. So maari na ho nating pabalikin ang worker natin sa trabaho. But of course, we have to observe the minimum public health standards. Okay. Maraming salamat po, Yusek, oh, sa pagpapaliwanag ng itong mga uh, questions na po ito. Marami pa hong katanungan, pero saan po kaya kayo pwede nga uh, i-reach out po, Yusek, Berhere? Para sa ganun, eh, marami pa silang pwedeng maliwanagan sa kanilang pag-intindi tungkol sa ano po ng COVID-19. Yes, ma'am. Uh, pwede nyo pong i-email uh, sa aming email ng opisina ko. I, I think the organizers know my email para po masagot namin at maipadala ho uli namin sa inyo para maari nyo pong i-discuss with the group uh, during your next meeting para naman po maliwanagan din ang ating mga members ng, ng uh, Philippine uh, College of Occupational Medicine para alam po din natin at guided tayo how we implement the response for COVID. Opo, maraming salamat po. At isa po sa guidelines po namin ay yun nga po no, na binibigay po ng DOH po na po sinusundan namin. Um, in behalf po ng ating uh, uh, Philippine College of Occupational Medicine po, maraming salamat po, Yusek Verhere, for giving us a chance na ano po, no, mapakinggan ng mas maliwanag po ang omnibus guidelines po ng ating COVID-19. Um, maraming salamat din po sa pag-answer po ng mga questions po. Although meron pa rin po maraming katanungan, uh, we would uh, reach out to you. Para sa ganun, mabahagi pa ho namin ang mga iba naming kailangan maliwanagan sa aming araw-araw uh, naming pakikibaka po against COVID-19. Okay? So, yun po. Maraming salamat. Sa ating uh, QCC Virtual Kapihan Team, excellent job everyone. Pinapangunahan po ni Dr. Jose Angela Taylor, ang ating PCOM QC Chapter Secretary. At uh, salamat po sa lahat na Umaten ngayong gabi. To formally end tonight's educational activity, ladies and gentlemen, our, uh, our chapter vice president, Dr. Jeremias Martin Clarante. Thank you very much, Dr. Aku. Thank you very much, uh, Yusek Berere. Um, this pandemic has brought so much difference to our lives. But our government, 
is there to help us understand and take action so we will be able to prevent and control the spread of the coronavirus disease 2019 or popularly known as COVID-19. Indeed, another night of great learning has passed. We hope that everyone has learned something about the new guidelines on the prevention, detection, isolation, treatment, and reintegration strategies for COVID-19. In whatever practice we have, be it in the healthcare industry, the academe, human resource, among others, it is my hope that we will be able to integrate our tonight's learning into our everyday activity for the safety and health of our fellow workers. It is at this juncture that in behalf of the Quezon City Chapter of the Philippine College of Occupational Medicine, I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to our resource person, DOH Under Secretary Maria Rosario Verhere, for sharing to us and allowing us to understand more than new interim guidelines. As we shift our attention to economic recovery from this public health crisis, all the more we need this guidance to ensure sustainability of our efforts. Allow me to thank as well all our members and officers of the chapter, the national officers who are here with us tonight, headed by Dr. Phil Pangilinan, to our colleagues from other chapters, and to all my fellow advocates in occupational safety and health. With, without your untiring support, this Kapihan will never reach on its 22nd and counting. As we all know, this Kapihan is one of the trademarks of the Quezon City chapter. I would like to thank also our technical support team for making this Kapihan truly a success Umabot po tayo ng 300 participants. Nilagpasan pa natin yung naunang 268 participants. Congratulations and kudos to another job well done. Allow me to announce to everyone tonight. Uh, tonight is the premiere night of our 21st Kapihang OH in our official YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel has already gathered 100 subscribers and counting. So do not forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell of our official YouTube channel to get updated to the latest issues presented during our Kapihang OH. This particular session, the 22nd Kapihang OH, will also be posted there soon. Likewise, please like our official Facebook page and follow our official Twitter and Instagram accounts to know what's new in our PICOM Quezon City chapter. To everyone, always remember that in Quezon City chapter of PICOM, we value your safety and health. Hashtag PICOM QCC cares. Mabuhay tayong lahat. Good evening and ingat po. Wow, congratulations. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jeremias Martin Clarante, for that wonderful closing remark. Congratulations, PCOM QCC hit 100 subscribers. Thank you, Paul. I would like to invite again everyone to like our official Facebook page, follow our Twitter and Instagram account. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification button for our official YouTube channel at the address that's shown below. Um, shown that's the screen. Muli maraming salamat sa pagdalo sa susunod na 23rd Kapihang OH. Ako po si Dr. Margo Venus Dasalya Ku na parating nagpapaalala sa Quezon City Chapter. Ang inyong kaligtasan at kalugsuran ay mahalaga. Hashtag PCOM QCC Cares. Good night everyone and stay safe and healthy. Mabuhay!